Hello, I'm Chetlin Crossnow, I'm a family medicine doctor here at Grace Clinic. And today we're going to be talking about three related diseases, uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, gastritis, and peptic ulcer disease. Uh, these are three diseases are related because all of them uh, have to do with acid in the stomach and misbehavior of the acid in the stomach. Uh, I should say, as always, uh, I hope you get some good information out of this. But if you think you have one of these problems, be sure to see your physician. Uh, that's especially important today because a lot of the symptoms of some of these diseases can, are like chest pain, uh, can mimic some really important other diseases like heart disease. So uh, be sure to see your doctor if you think you have one of these problems. Um, so to start with, uh, these are very common problems uh, and they occur throughout the lifespan. You know, even babies can get reflux. Children and adolescents frequently get uh, ulcers, and then of course, that continues throughout life. Uh, so it affects really almost everyone. Uh, I saw a article that said that uh, in a survey, uh, over 50 percent of Americans had had uh, symptoms of heartburn in the last week. So these are very common problems. Um, and uh, so if you are watching this and haven't had this, then consider yourself lucky. So let's first talk about the relevant anatomy of uh, the esophagus and the stomach. So here we have uh, our esophagus coming down, going into the lower esophageal sphincter, which is a big player and or maybe a big bad guy in this story, and going into the stomach, which looks something like this. We have the fundus, the body of the stomach, and then the pylorus going down into the pyloric sphincter, which then opens up again into the duodenum, which is something like that. And then goes into the remainder of the small intestine, uh, where the majority of digestion and uh, absorption takes place. There's another important structure here called where the uh, common bile duct comes in. I'm just going to draw that there. That's where the digestive juices from the pancreas and the liver come in, uh, and that's important for reasons we'll talk about later. So here we have uh, the stomach, and as you probably know, uh, the stomach is full of acid, right? I kind of like to think about it like this lake of acid that's boiling and it's putting off fumes and little critters fall in and scream in agony. No, well, that's fanciful, but it is very strong acid. It's hydrochloric acid, um, as you've probably experienced when, with heartburn or when you throw up, you get this stuff. It tastes terrible. It burns. It hurts. It's very strong acid. So I think a reasonable thing to ask is, why do we have this powerful, possibly dangerous acid sitting in the middle of our stomachs and, uh, or in the middle of our bodies? And the reason is, is a couple of things. First of all, it helps with digestion. Um, it begins the process of food digestion. The acid environment activates some important enzymes to help with digestion. And then second of all, it's uh, protective. Uh, the acid kills bugs, both uh, microscopic organisms and little bugs. Uh, our ancestors' food was not as clean as ours is, and so that was a real issue. Uh, fortunately, our stomachs are protected from this powerful acid by a layer of mucus and cells that prevents the acid from damaging the stomach. And so that way that this potentially dangerous acid becomes an important uh, protective and digestive mechanism for us. So let's look at each of these conditions in turn, uh, starting with reflux. So gastroesophageal reflux is when acid from the stomach comes up through the lower esophageal sphincter into the esophagus. Um, the esophagus does not have this protective layer of mucus and cells, and so when it gets up here, it begins to burn and irritate the esophagus. Um, now, everybody gets reflux occasionally. Uh, to really have gastroesophageal reflux disease means that you have it frequently, uh, it's recurrent, uh, or that it uh, really interferes with life in some way. And so, uh, but it's still very, very common. You know, the lower esophageal sphincter, I, I kind of think about it kind of like the Homer Simpson of organs. It falls asleep on the job, doesn't do his job a lot of times. 
and acid gets up through here and irritates the esophagus. Um, and that causes uh, pain. Uh, so real quick, let's talk about the pain from uh, reflux. This is a bit of a tangent, but I think it will be helpful. Um, our bodies, the sensory system, nervous system is kind of divided into two parts. That there's the somatic sensation, and that's like what's on our skin. Uh, and so the somatic sensation is very uh, precise and uh, it has a lot of different components. So for example, uh, you can tell a difference whether you're, you'd be touched here or over here. Uh, when you're touched, you can, you can say, okay, now it's not there, now it is, now it's not. So uh, it's a very precise system, both in location and time. Furthermore, there's different levels of touch, there's different types of pain fibers, and there's temperature sensations. So it's a very precise system. And that system is also in our mouths. You can feel things move around in your mouth, right? And then when we swallow, if you'll notice, when you swallow, the food kind of vanishes somewhere down here in the middle of our chest, at least to where we can tell exactly where it is, right? And that's because we're moving from somatic sensation into visceral sensation. Visceral sensation is what uh, is in our gastrointestinal system and importantly also in the cardiac system. And it, it's a very different kind, type of sensation. In uh, visceral sensation, it's not that precise. Uh, you can't tell exactly where things are, uh, you, which is good. You wouldn't want to know where things are in your stomach and your intestines. Um, it is uh, not, but, but it's very sensitive to things like stretch. So that's why when bloating can be painful. And it's also sensitive to irritation that might happen uh, on the surface of the stomach. So what does that have to do with reflux? Well, uh, the lower part of the esophagus is visceral sensation. That means that pain from the lower esophagus has this squeezing, dull, aching kind of pain. It, it, it really sounds a lot like what people describe as, a, as, as cardiac pain, as heart pain. And that's frequently an issue in an emergency room is determining is this pain from the heart or is it coming from the esophagus? But then as the acid gets further up and it, the irritation gets further up, then you get more into that burning kind of pain that we associate with heartburn and kind of uh, causing pain even in the throat. So that's the different kinds of pain that can happen uh, from reflux. But pain isn't the only problem that happens from reflux. Uh, also, acid in the esophagus can uh, cause the, uh, the epithelium of the esophagus to kind of clamp down. It causes esophageal strictures, uh, which can make difficulty swallowing. Um, when, especially when we're laying down at night, sometimes the, re the acid can get all the way up into the pharynx, spill over into the bronchi, and cause uh, things like asthma and a chronic cough. Uh, chronic cough is actually one of the most, or uh, one of the most common causes of a chronic, chronic cough is reflux. So um, also uh, gastroesophageal reflux is associated with hiatal hernias. A hiatal hernia is when part of the stomach kind of tries to go up uh, past the diaphragm, either next to the um, esophagus or even kind of inside the esophagus. Uh, the hiatal hernias can hurt because the diaphragm clamps down on them and uh, it can cause the reflux to be worse. So, then one of the worst problems with reflux is that when the acid gets up into the esophagus, the esophagus kind of tries to protect itself by changing the mucosa to more something like the gastric mucosa to protect itself, which sounds like a good idea, right? But actually it's not because uh, when cells um, try to change from one kind to the other, they're, they're losing control of their, um, of their re uh, replication and that can actually be a precancerous condition. Um, when you begin to get gastric mucosa in the uh, esophagus, that's a condition called Barrett's esophagus. And uh, some people uh, need to, uh, uh, be evaluated for that after they've had reflux for several years uh, if they have a lot of uh, other uh, risk factors, particularly uh, being a white male uh, over 50 years of age, which is, and, um, or if they're a smoker. Uh, and 
if they have Barrett's esophagus, then that needs to be monitored regularly to make sure that they don't develop esophageal cancer. So that's uh, that reflux, which incidentally, so the way we look for that is through endoscopy. And that's kind of the first time I've talked about endoscopy in this lecture. And I want to go over that just real quick. Um, the ability to take a camera and go down here with a flexible scope has really helped with our diagnosis and our understanding of these diseases. Um, technically, a endoscopy of this area is called an esophagogastroduodenoscopy, or an EGD, uh, because they can go all the way down here to look and see what's going on. Um, EG, undergoing an EGD is a really painless thing to do if you ever need to have one done. Uh, it's, it's really not that big of a problem. Uh, that you're asleep for that procedure. Um, okay, so let's move down into the stomach. So, and talk about gastritis. Um, as you probably know, in medicine, when we use the suffix itis, um, we are talking about inflammation of whatever it was that came before. So, for example, tonsillitis is inflammation of the tonsils. Inflammation of the stomach is stomachitis. Well, we don't say that in English, we say it in Latin, gastrogastritis. So gastritis means inflammation of the stomach, which is what happens when this uh, mucosal layer uh, that's protecting the stomach begins to break down. Um, if that process is allowed to continue, well, first of all, gastritis kind of is, is usually kind of all over the stomach with some irritation and so forth. If that process continues, then in certain places, that acid kind of breaks through and begins to eat away at the walls of the stomach and that's what that's when we get an ulcer peptic ulcer disease you can get ulcers anywhere in the stomach you can also you can get them in the esophagus by the way from uh, and you can get them uh, in the even down into the duodenum when the acid comes down through here you don't usually get them further because the the digestive juices here are basic and they neutralize that acid so really the acid is supposed to only be be present from about here to about here. Um, so anyway, gastritis, peptic ulcer disease. So what uh, could could possibly, what could cause this breakdown? There are a couple of major things, and those are um, first of all medications. There's some real common medications, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, um, which can cause a breakdown of this layer. That's like aspirin. Uh, uh, naproxen, which is Aleve, uh, ibuprofen, which is uh, Advil, and some prescription medicines like Meloxicam and, um, and uh, Diclofenac and, and several others. Uh, can they're great for arthritis, but they can really cause a breakdown in that mucosal layer. Another major problem is there's actually a bacteria that lives in the stomach or can live in the stomach called Helicobacter pylori or H for Helicobacter pylori. This is a really interesting uh, scientific um, discovery that happened back in the 80s to find out that uh, this bacteria frequently caused ulcers. And once they found that and began to treat it, it really helped decrease the incidence of ulcers. Um, there are a lot of other things that can lead to problems with that mucosal layer. Uh, in, uh, very spicy foods tend to cause problems, uh, alcohol, caffeine, uh, even stress tends to increase the amount of acid that we produce and can cause problems in the mucosal layer. So what kind of symptoms do we get with gastritis and ulcers? Well, gastritis, uh, the, the main thing you usually get is nausea. Sometimes vomiting, but that usually causes nausea. It can cause pain, and then, but then it's really when the process continues and we start to develop ulcers, they begin to have these terrible pains in the stomach. And that's, that's what's kind of infamous is the pain from ulceration uh, that can be really painful. And if that's allowed to continue in the worst case, this doesn't happen much anymore, but uh, you can even perforate through the walls of the stomach or duodenum or esophagus, and uh, that can be uh, fatal if not addressed immediately. So one thing I really like to point out is that um, Sometimes people will come in and say, uh, you know, I've had an ulcer before. I don't think it, that's what this is now because it feels different. And an important thing to understand is that 
uh, ulcers in different parts or gastritis in different parts of this system are going to feel very different. The stomach's a large organ, particularly when we put in the esophagus, the duodenum in that. A duodenal ulcer will feel very different than a peptic ulcer, um, and different parts of the stomach can uh, feel differently. Sometimes it may radiate to the chest, cause chest pain, it may cause more abdominal pain, it may cause back pain. Uh, it, so it's not ever really sure what that is. Okay, so that is uh, the general uh, cause and symptoms that will happen from these kind of diseases. And in the next uh, lecture, I want to talk about the treatment of them. Just as a, a preview, uh, fortunately, the treatment of these, medic of these problems uh, is, uh, is very successful these days. This is something that we can usually help people with, sometimes even in a matter of hours. Thanks.